afternoon. I'm Kristen Abrams. I'm the Senior Director of the Combating Human Trafficking Program here at the McCain Institute. Our work focuses on protecting some of the world's most vulnerable from exploitation. As a part of that program, we focus on two things, dismantling the systems that allow human trafficking to flourish and enabling governments to hold traffickers accountable. I want to thank Ali and Commander Massoud for their work to fight for liberty, justice, human rights, and freedom for the people of Afghanistan. Like so much of our work at the McCain Institute, our next group of distinguished panelists are advocates and leaders who work tirelessly to bring about a world that is free, safe, and just for all. So join me in welcoming this panel. Thank you so much. I'm um, very honored to uh, be here with you to talk about a subject um, that was near and dear to uh, Senator McCain's heart and uh, a cause of his life. Um, I am uh, Tom Malinowski, uh, now a senior fellow uh, at the McCain Institute, former congressman, former assistant secretary of state for human rights uh, and democracy. Um, when I was asked to do this panel, um, I uh, saw the, the theme and the participants and I thought, gosh, this is a typical John McCain thing. We've got people from all over the world. We've got an Afghan freedom fighter, a North Korean defector, a Taiwanese diplomat, a couple of uh, guys from Washington, DC. Um, what, 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 what brings all of this together? And I think the common theme is America, the fact that um, if you are somebody struggling for freedom and human rights anywhere in the world, you are still looking to us, to our country, for help and support, for legitimacy. Um, John McCain uh, used to say that America is a country with a conscience. And he believed very strongly, as I do, that America's conscience is one of our comparative advantages in the world. Um, we've talked a lot about our alliances and partnerships in the world. Uh, today and yesterday, our conscience is one reason we have allies and partners and why our authoritarian adversaries have none. Because despite our self-evident faults and inconsistencies as a country, people around the world sense that we are a unique world power and that we at least sometimes use our power to help others. Um, we sometimes use our power in defense of an idea that is not just American, that appeals to everyone from a woman in Afghanistan uh, to somebody fighting for uh, their freedom and liberty in Ukraine. There are still those, um, and maybe unfortunately increasingly those in Washington, who might say, yes, that's all nice conscience and liberty and values and morality, but you have to understand that America is no longer um, the, the, the sole dominant power in the world, we don't have the juice to be able to um, advance and protect those values in the way that we used to. Um, and I have to say, as a Democrat, particularly in my party, I hear um, that uh, theory expressed. And I don't know, I looked at the, the numbers and the facts and, um, and found that, well, in 1990, the United States had about 25% of the global economy. And today, we represent 25% of the global economy. 1992, we um, had about 36% of global military spending. Today, it's 38%. Um, the use of the dollar in international transactions, um, about the same, if not slightly more today, than at any point in the last 20 years. American companies have, mar have invented and deployed all around the world the technology, for better and worse, that virtually every person in the planet uses to learn about what's happening in the world. And democracy is certainly not a spent idea because we now have a superpower, uh, namely Russia, that is uh, fighting a war to extinguish democracy. That's how threatened it is by this idea that's associated with the United States. And another superpower that we all fear might um, want to start a war um, over the same um, thing. 
And so I want to start with that, actually, and, uh, and start with you, Ambassador. Um, and talk a little bit about um, Taiwan's cause right now. And, and in particular, I wonder if you would agree with me that what threatens Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership about Taiwan is democracy. It's the fact that this is a place where millions and millions of Chinese people who share a culture, a language, a civilization with Chinese people on the mainland have shown that you can have all of that and freely elect your leaders um, and have freedom of speech and religion and expression. Um, and that therefore the example is profoundly threatening to um, the CCP. Would you agree? Um, yes, I agree. But um, first, I also want to um, express my gratitude to the McCain Institute for uh, including um, us in this uh, dialogue and uh, in being here at the forum um, on the uh, you know, compatibility of democracy and Asian culture. We have seen a number of um, authoritarian leaders uh, in the region uh, espousing uh, a narrative uh, that says democracy is a Western construct. Uh, not part of uh, our culture, uh, neither is it inherent uh, in our traditions. Uh, but I think the fact that Taiwan is a robust and free democracy does prove them wrong. Um, and you know, it, it, we don't take our democracy for granted. Uh, it took years of struggle to fight for freedom, uh, surviving 37 years of martial law, um, within my generation, I grew up uh, in a uh, society where we had a state, you know, a, 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 a one-party state uh, where there was no such thing as an opposition. Uh, but we have evolved uh, since then uh, into becoming one of the uh, most liberal societies uh, in the region, the most open democracies uh, as recognized internationally. And, uh, but I, I think, you know, to, to add to that, you know, it's not just about values and, and what we aspire to as human beings, uh, you know, not just Asians or, 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 or citizens uh, with uh, aspects of Chinese civilization in our culture. But um, uh, I, I think what we've also struggled to prove is that democracy delivers. Um, and, you know, despite the claims of the BRI and, you know, the, the efficiency of uh, uh, speedy delivery of authoritarian systems, uh, cutting corners, uh, you know, against uh, you know popular discussions or townhouse. Um, I think we have also uh, strived to prove that democracy does deliver and that democracy uh, does uh, uh, contribute to human progress. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's all aspects of what democracy represents: um, accountability, transparency, uh, anti-corruption. Um, you know, a space for innovation and creativity. Uh, that creates the technology that advances a human progress instead of controlling society. Um, I think all of that uh, is exemplified in Taiwan. And um, I, I do not, the only part of your statement is I don't agree that Taiwan is a threat, although some uh, people may, may see it that way. But um, um, I, I think I finally want to make the point on this subject is that I, I think the um, protection and preservation and defense of freedom in Taiwan is the best chance that the people of China will also see freedom in the future. Right. I, I meant threat only in the sense that the, the idea is, mm -hmm. is, is the threat, um, much like Hong Kong, right? That this outpost of respect for rule of law and relative democracy was um, very offensive to, to China. Um, let me ask you, we've, we've mentioned, I think, a couple of times the, the relationship between the, 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 the issues at stake in Taiwan and the issues at stake in, in Ukraine. Um, and I want to put this in very practical terms. The United States, we've provided very generous support, rightly, uh, in my view, to Ukraine, military and economic support. Um, that, uh, that money is likely to run out uh, later this year. Um, September, October, uh, at the current rate, and Congress is going to have to make another decision whether to continue uh, to provide that, that essential support for Ukraine. As you well know, there are, there's bipartisan support in the House and the Senate, but, but there is a growing uh, voice among some uh, in Washington that, um, that says, you know, China's the real threat. And what we're doing to support Ukraine, the money we're spending, the munitions we're providing, um, somehow uh, it, it detracts from our ability to defend uh, Taiwan against 
uh, a potential Chinese invasion. So I want to ask you, since there are members of Congress here, they have to make a decision. Um, from, as a representative of the Taiwanese government and the Taiwanese people, what, what would you say to that? Um, should they, when uh, they have to make this decision again, should they continue, from Taiwan's point of view, to provide military and economic support to Ukraine? Um, let me first give you the short political answer and then elaborate a little, um, if time permits. But um, you know, the, the short answer is that Ukraine's survival is Taiwan's survival. Ukraine's success is Taiwan's success. Um, and the irony is that our, our future is closely linked, although I must admit uh, before the tragedy of the Russian invasion, uh, Taiwan and Ukraine had very little connection, very little contact, very little uh, interaction. Um, but um, the, the unprovoked invasion was a watershed moment in the minds of many Taiwanese people. Um, and um, you know, the, the fight uh, against um, aggression, uh, the point that the Ukrainian people are striving to preserve freedom uh, against coercion um, is um, also an as aspiration that the people of Taiwan uh, feel strongly uh, about. And so I think um, support for Ukraine is part of, you know, it's relevant to us uh, because first of all, it um, um, ultimately helps to deter. Um, it imposes costs on the aggressor and uh, which we would assume uh, would figure into any kind of rational calculation uh, in making a significant strategic decisions. Um, the second aspect of, of deterrence is that um, um, you know, we are seeing a scenario of Ukrainian resistance and strong determination uh, to, to fight. Um, and uh, it is a situation that we see as asymmetric. Um, that is a, a, a smaller state and society resisting one of the most powerful militaries in the world, or, or so that we thought um, you know, prior to this invasion. Um, and uh, as we see the uh, resistance continuing uh, to hold off on uh, such an invasion, uh, we um, uh, also see in that a spirit of resilience uh, that we know we have to um, adopt, uh, we have to learn. In fact, uh, as Taiwanese, we are learning a lot uh, from the asymmetric um, um, counter-invasion strategies that the Ukrainian people are, are adopting, uh, including uh, some of the uh, modern uh, technologies and weapon systems uh, that, are, that are broadly used, including uh, a revolution in military culture, which involves decentralization of command and more small unit uh, mobile uh, forces resisting, uh, including the principle of a whole of society uh, effort uh, in, in defense. This is not just a military aspect, but a whole of society aspect. So we're also learning many lessons, and we've been um, deeply inspired. Of course, uh, we do not you know, uh, our, our goal is to prevent that tragedy from being repeated uh, in our society. But um, ultimately, uh, we know we, we need to be strong uh, to deter. And um, uh, I think that inspiration has also generated a lot of sympathy for the Ukrainian people. And there's been a tremendous, uh, incredible amount of, uh, you know, outpour of uh, humanitarian assistance and, and charity. You know, we just sent a, a medical uh, assistance group uh, to Ukraine um, to provide pro bono uh, medical humanitarian services uh, to the Ukrainian people. So, so that, that deep you know, emotional uh, connection is there, but it's also strategic uh, because it serves a purpose of deterrence. But there's another strategic uh, aspect of it, and, and that is um, you know, international support for, for Ukraine is also essential in um, affirming uh, the credibility and reliability of the United States and your allies. Um, you know, in this case, uh, your NATO allies, but of course, um, you know, other major democracies uh, uh, in preserving the rules-based international order. And, and that credibility is important because on a daily basis, uh, we are operating in a very complicated information environment. You know, information warfare, psychological, cognitive, warfare uh, on our people, aimed at sowing discontent in our society, distrust of our democratic institutions, skepticism uh, in the reliability of the United States. You know, all of that is happening as we speak. And so I think a consistency of, of support for um, efforts to counter um, aggression, uh, to resist uh, military coercion, I, I think is also very important uh, in our efforts at deterrence. Right. So if we weren't willing to spend 
a few billion dollars to help Ukraine, it might call into question our willingness to sacrifice anything for, for Taiwan. Um, I want to turn to North Korea um, and to you, Soyhun. Um, and I want to, uh, well, rather than introducing you, I think I'd, I'd, I want to ask you to tell your story as, uh, as somebody who was born in North Korea and uh, is now uh, studying at, at Columbia University. And, and um, tell us um, the, the, the highlights of, of your story, of, of your journey from North Korea to the United States and, and what it should mean to all of us. Um, so before I begin, I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the McCain Institute for having me. And as a human rights advocate, I'm humbled to be part of this esteemed community today. Um, so my journey as a North Korean defector is not the typical story of the hunger and hardship which is so prevalent in my home country. Um, as a daughter of senior government officer, I had some privileges that were not valuable to most North Koreans. I attended the schools that can be seen as the most prestigious um, education in North Korea, and I was sent to China to study abroad in 2010. Um, but what I want to say is that I didn't realize that I lived in privilege when I was in um, when I was living in North Korea, just like fish doesn't know they're under the water. Um, also, I didn't realize that those privileges I enjoyed as part of the elite class were traded off those constant um, surveillance and then life-threatening risks. Um, so. I would say I took both these benefits and drawbacks for all granted. And this became clear um, till when I was studying in China. An accidental conversation with a random Chinese taxi driver um, actually planted the seed of doubt in my mind about the dictatorship. So, Upon he discovered that I was from North Korea, he looked at me with the weird eye, and then he pointed a picture of Deng Xiaoping, Chinese leader, hanging on the rearview mirror of his car, and then explained how China was able to get out of the poverty through the economic reforms. And then he asked me a question, why your leader, Kim Jong-il, um, didn't implement the economic reforms just like China did, uh, and instead left your people to starve death. So his question led me to see my country and the leadership from a whole different angle. And um, the beliefs I had in the regime started to crumble. But um, after the next two years, um, I mean, it didn't took me to the, get to the breaking point um, on, after the, another two years um, when I witnessed my best friend uh, was taken away by the security agent right in front of my eyes. Um, that was the 2013 December, and I spent four years with her, she was my roommate at the college as well. It was in a time in China, by the way. So the agents just suddenly um, showed up and took her, took her away. And then after two hours, I received a message from her that she doesn't think that she can come back and ask me to take care of her personal items. So I couldn't really believe that those things that happened to her because I lived with the model that as long as we follow the workers' party and then be loyal to the leadership, nothing bad would happen. So that was the model that doesn't speak loudly, but implemented in most North Korean Ellis family, the um, kids. But uh, when I faced these tragedies happened to the people around me, um, I realized that how desperate my country was in need of change. And then to the dictator, we are nothing more than the slaves. Yep. We are all disposable to him. So, and what I wanna highlight here is that 
um, th that was this, just the beginning of the um, series of the purge under the Kim Jong-un regime, um, starting from the end of 2013 until our family left um, in 2014. Hundreds of the people were executed and their family members were sent to the political prison camp. And even um, a newborn baby, five months newborn baby of my neighbor were sent to the political prison camp and people were died in front of their family members without body press remaining. And then, so it was my epiphany, um, but what really held me back to another year to make that decision is that guilt by association system. We know that what are gonna happen to our family members left behind. Um, I was lucky to escape the country with my core family members, but um, my relatives who left behind in North Korea, I later discovered that my uncle was uh, put in a lifetime sentence in prison because our family left North Korea. So, I mean, it was a difficult decision and then it was the dilemma. I would say most North Korean defectors or even the North Korean elites um, have. They don't want to ignore those tragedies that happen to the people, but they cannot take the risk of their three generations um, because of their beliefs against the, um, the regime. So, but I spent my eight years in Freedom World, but, uh, and what I wanna tell people um, inside of North Korea and also the outside world is that nothing is more valuable than the freedom. It is something like that uh, we cannot put the price tag on the human beings, right? And then I believe it is the same with the freedom. Um, nothing is more than valuable the freedom and that is something uh, we should cherish and protect. And I wanna really see that North Korean people see the values of the freedom and democracy. So that's why I am fighting for, um, for the freedom and rights, human rights of the, my fellow North Korean people and pursuing um, educations in America to prepare for a better future in democracy when they too become free. Right. So you, you, you mentioned those moments mm -hmm. of recognition. North Korea, of course, being unique, uniquely horrible among totalitarian regimes mm -hmm. in, in how successful it has been in denying most of its people even the knowledge of an outside world that, that is different. So, so many North Koreans grow up believing that they're living in the world's greatest country. They don't know how people in South Korea live. Um, but you had this moment with the taxi driver and then of course another more harrowing moment um, later on. Are, are there things that the United States and the international community can do to um, give more North Koreans those moments of recognition, to mm -hmm. burst through that bubble or that wall right. that, that the, the regime has placed around the country with information about what the world is really like, and would that help? I think first of all, uh, what we should do is raise more of those voices against the long-term dictatorships, and then we should um, have them be held accountable for the crimes they committed inside of the, their own country. Uh, and then send, by sending information, um, empowering the people with the information is critical. Um, only when they can realize their reality, I believe they will equip uh, with the forces to fight against for their own freedom and the rights. Um, so. so by information, we mean not just, you know, political stuff, newspapers, mm -hmm. the news, we, we mean movies, we, TV shows, um, art, culture, uh, it just anything that shows people what, how we live in democratic societies. And, and I suppose particularly South Korea because it, there's so much in common, culturally, mm -hmm. linguistically, and yet um, the, the, the degree of freedom and prosperity is so, so much greater. Um, 
I think you actually told me a story about uh, about uh, seeing what was the American movie you saw as a as a kid, Home Alone, right? Yeah, it was a Home Alone. Yeah, uh, I once met a North Korean defector who told me she was radicalized um, against the regime uh, by watching Titanic, mm -hmm. a smuggled copy of Titanic. Yeah. And what was political about Titanic? Well, the, the idea that, well, somebody could sacrifice their life to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And in, 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 in that society, the government taught, you know, you, you, everybody is for themselves. Um, and so even little things like that. When I was at the State Department running the Human Rights Bureau, we had a program of supporting groups that were smuggling um, DVDs, uh, flash drives, with that kind of stuff into North Korea. My favorite part was uh, we had a group that was flying drones across the Chinese border. They had an agent in North Korea who would order movies mm -hmm. based on what the people in his community wanted to see. Um, that information was smuggled out and then the drone would literally airdrop um, thumb drives with the movies that were requested. So I felt like I was running Netflix for North Korea, but for a very serious purpose. Um, yeah. And anyway, we need to do more of that. Dan, uh, you run IRI, the International Republican Institute. Uh, you're active in, what, over 100 countries around the world right now. I, I want to come back to kind of where I started, the sense among some of our colleagues in Washington that American influence on behalf of democracy is not what it used to be. Is that your experience working in all of these countries day, day to day? Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I think John McCain would be very proud of the ladies up here on stage mm -hmm. and all the freedom fighters who are here. Uh, so I'm very pleased and honored to be in there in your company. Um, there is extraordinary demand for accountability, transparency, responsive governance around the world. It actually doesn't have a lot to do with the United States. We should be on the side of the forces of freedom in the world, uh, but the forces of freedom will keep fighting even if we're navel-gazing at home or fighting amongst ourselves. Uh, that said, we have a strategic interest in supporting people standing up for democratic dignity around the world. Why? Uh, we know that uh, effective democratic institutions produce the kind of prosperity that autocracy does not. There's a strange myth propagated by the Chinese Communist Party that somehow the way to aggressive modernization is a modern form of like techno-authoritarianism. Uh, most countries that are dictatorships look a lot more like Zimbabwe than look like China, right? Uh, Taiwan on a per capita basis is three times richer than China. So is South Korea. Japan is four times richer. I could go on, but the leading examples of prosperity in Asia and in the world are not autocracies. Right? So effective democratic institutions are much better at producing prosperity. They're much better at producing security. Uh, think about the kind of security produced by South Korea, one of our most important uh, military allies, and the gross insecurity produced by North Korea. It tells you a lot. Uh, think about West Germany at the heart of NATO in the Cold War versus East Germany uh, and the danger it posed uh, to the free world during the Cold War. Uh, democracies do not export millions of refugees like Venezuela has done under Maduro, or Syria has done under Assad. Uh, they do not illegally traffic in nuclear and other weapons uh, in the same way that North Korea and China and other countries have illegally proliferated around the world. They are sources of stability. America's best allies are democracies. To come back, just to close out where you started, Tom, uh, there is extraordinary demand for democratic dignity in the world. You have just seen over the last year, you've not only seen Ukrainians fighting for freedom, and I think some of the most inspirational images we've seen since, I don't know, the Battle of Britain. Uh, you've also seen the biggest protests in China since Tiananmen Square, okay? You've seen the biggest protests in Iran since the founding of the Islamic Republic. And in Russia, you've seen millions of people either first protest and then leave that country. So these are the hardest cases, China, Russia, Iran. Uh, People are standing up. In 2019, before COVID shut down the world for a year or two, there were more street power movements, protests in the world than at any time since 1989, which was the year the Berlin Wall fell and the world changed. 
right? I think we're coming back to that world. The Freedom House report that just came out a month ago shows that as many countries are actually making democratic progress as, as are backsliding, right. which breaks a 17-year trend of democratic backsliding. And I think authoritarians should be a bit afraid. I think uh, the courage of Taiwanese should give them courage. Uh, the courage of Ukrainians uh, should give people in these societies courage. And authoritarians should be worried. And we, as I think members of Congress and others have mentioned earlier today, we should be much more confident that we are on the right side of history and standing up for universal values. Yep, here, here. So, um, you mentioned the, the, the connection to our security interests. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I kind of, I, I often encounter people who are very skeptical, you know, that yes, of course, dictatorships are the threat and democracies are our allies, but they're very skeptical of the possibility of change in these countries. Um, they're skeptical that we can do anything to promote that change. There, there are studies that, that I've recently seen that that demonstrate that the success of those mass protest movements in bringing about democratic change has declined over the last 20 or 30 years. That's a whole other conversation about why that is. But um, those same studies show that they're still successful 20, 30 percent of the time. There are studies about US sanctions as a tool to promote that kind of change, which tend to be very dismissive because they find sanctions only work 10 or 20 percent of the time. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, but when I look at those percentages, I'm like, oh my God, there's something in our foreign policy that could work 20% of the time <laughs> in dealing with these kinds of countries. I mean, we've been, how many decades have, been trying, have we been trying to denuclearize North Korea and Iran? It's been the priority of our diplomacy, and rightly so. That's our primary national security interest with respect to these countries. But how successful have we been through... Um, other means of, of foreign policy. Um, if there is a 10 or 20 percent chance that at some point in the next 10 or 20 years, a country like North Korea, like Iran, ultimately China, might change through internal democratic transformation, sounds like that's a, those are pretty good odds in comparison to everything else, don't you think? Worth promoting, worth encouraging? Yes. Uh, I had an Iranian uh, democracy leader in my office uh, just a few months ago. And I said, courage to the protesters, but of course America cannot su support you overtly because that would delegitimize your cause. Mm -hmm. He said, on the contrary, we'll take all the American support we can get. And I think we have gotten into a habit of talking ourselves out of supporting peaceful mass movements. Uh, we have talked ourselves into a position where we sort of use the full toolkit of engagement once a country has a transition. Uh, Countries, people, Democrats are looking for our help. Uh, autocrats don't like being on sanction lists. There are a lot of Russian oligarchs who are really unhappy that they cannot uh, educate their children in the West or park their yachts in the West. There are a lot of Chinese elites who have embedded their uh, family wealth in the West, have educated their children in the West. Uh, I think we underestimate the power of these instruments and we underestimate the appeal of open societies. Tom, I would just like to make one more point, which is I've had so many frustrating conversations with our fellow Americans about the fact that, oh, we have to be much more realist because we're looking out at a strategic competition in the world. But, and this comes back to this Iranian in my office, uh, autocrats are supporting each other very actively. Uh, Iran is arming Russia against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. China has been diplomatically supporting Russia and protecting it in the United Nations and elsewhere during the struggle in Ukraine. Autocrats are working very closely together. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin held a summit, which many of you saw quite recently, in which a hot mic caught Xi Jinping saying to Vladimir Putin, the biggest changes in 100 years are happening and we're driving them, right? So autocrats are, have no shyness about concerting. And I'm always quite confused when those of us who live in the free world think that we shouldn't support each other to the maximum. Yep. Right, because that's what the adversaries are doing and they wanna dismantle the free and open and democratic world that America and our allies built that enabled more prosperity and security than has ever existed on this earth. Okay, let me, let me ask you a slightly tougher question. Um, we all agree Chinese Communist Party, bad, Putin, bad. Um, Taiwan is a democracy, it's our ally. We should defend it. Ukraine, um, the same thing. Um, 
Just as during the Cold War, we, we had a consensus that the Soviet Union was the epitome of everything that we stood against in, in, in the world. But there was this, this phenomenon during the Cold War, which led to a lot of controversy in the United States, that sometimes to oppose the main enemy, which then was the Soviet Union, we aligned ourselves with um, smaller countries around the world that uh, exhibited many of the same characteristics. And, and often these smaller dictatorships would play us off against our great power authoritarian adversary. They'd say, well, if you don't give us military aid, if you don't, you know, if you're too tough on us on human rights, well, we'll just go to the Russians. Now we see countries doing the same thing. Usually it's with respect to China, right? If you're too tough on us, well, we'll buy our weapons from the Chinese or we'll play around with the Russians. Um, we face this dilemma most acutely right now and consequentially in the Persian Gulf, mm -hmm. where we have these partners, Saudi Arabia, the UAE in particular, um, that are absolute, as absolute dictatorships as Iran is. Um, but they have quite effectively are persuaded some uh, in the policy world in Washington that uh, if we don't deal with them at a time when we're in conflict with Russia and China, that um, they will go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, how would you advise us to wrestle with that challenge? Thanks for the I think you know how I feel. <laughs> so look, during the Cold War, we built a free world coalition mm -hmm. that included quite a few unfree countries, but they opposed the expansion of the Soviet empire and the crushing of freedom, even if they were not free. So I'm for building the biggest coalition we can. That said, uh, I have a little more faith than, I know you have faith also, but maybe than some people. Uh, prosperity will produce middle classes, has produced middle classes in these countries. They eventually will demand political rights, just like prosperity produced uh, a large middle class in Taiwan and South Korea and the Philippines who ultimately demanded political rights, Indonesia, led those countries towards more open societies. Right. But we didn't just rely on the middle classes to do it. We also advocated. We leaned in. You advocated. We sure did. Right. No, we sure did. And President Reagan actually right. facilitated these key transitions in Asia in the 80s. Uh, so uh, there's another element here, which isn't just about whose side are you on. It's also about state capture. We have seen countries that are not effective democracies have their elites co-opted, corrupted, coerced by China in ways that quite upset citizens in those countries. So I would also make a distinction between what citizens want and what maybe a younger generation is looking for, including in the Persian Gulf, and what some of the older leaders uh, are uh, driving. Okay. And if, say, uh, a partner like Saudi Arabia is buying Russian oil, um, undercutting our European allies by keeping the price of gasoline artificially high, um, how should we respond to that? Uh, President Biden went to, uh, to Riyadh uh, after having denounced the dictatorships of the region to ask for uh, some help in, in this larger struggle against Ukraine. And, and the answer was um, actually the opposite of what we had hoped for. Yeah. So people in these countries are gonna have to do it. You and I are not gonna do it, right? You know that. But I would also just point out an additional complicating factor here, which is that many autocracies in the Gulf and beyond are intervening all over the world. Uh, look at what just happened in Sudan. Right. Right? On the wrong uh, side. On the wrong, on the wrong side. side. Uh, that, that my institute used to walk into countries and there were people in these countries trying to build out some democratic space mm -hmm. and then there were authoritarian forces in these countries. Now, we work in these countries, there are people trying to build out democratic space, there are authoritarian forces domestically and there are all these foreign powers intervening in quite malign ways mm -hmm. in many of these countries. So I would make this a case for greater American engagement, not just on democracy, but using the full toolkit of our uh, power and influence, that we are not looking out at a pristine world where it's a question of simply an internal struggle, that uh, malign foreign actors mm -hmm. are actively involved in many countries in ways uh, that uh, tilt the playing field against any kind of democratic transition. Right as you would probably agree from the Taiwanese standpoint. Let me give, uh, give you and Sai Hun uh, a chance to make any final comments since we're down to 
just a few minutes. Thank you. I just want to quickly um, continue on uh, Dan's um, comments about the full tool toolkits in supporting democracy. And I know this uh, this particular forum has had you know has has been quite engaging on the military and security side of, of things. But um, you know there is the aspect of uh, democracy delivery, uh, including economic prosperity and uh, the need to counter economic coercion. Uh, there is a need to um, uh, open the door to greater information space. And it's often uh, the open information that prompts uh, change uh, internally. And ultimately, um, it's internal change that is sustainable. Uh, no democracy is sustainable if it's transplanted from external forces. Uh, as goodwill as we are in supporting democracies in other countries, ultimately it involves uh, engaging uh, with the civil society actors, uh, with the next generation, with those who aspire uh, to these values. But I do want to make a final point, and that is um, you know, throughout um, our discussion of, of Ukraine or the security uh, situation uh, in Taiwan, I think one lesson, important lesson that we've also learned is um, we um, must be determined to defend if we are to expect uh, any help from others. And um, uh, investing in our own security, investing uh, in uh, strengthening our economy, our top priorities, and um, the partnership with the United States is critical in sustaining that momentum. Thank you. So, Hyun? Um, so, I absolutely agree that the now, today's world are face a new challenge that um, the invasion of the Russia to Ukraine and the, the uh, Chinese community parties that threaten to the Taiwan, um, and then the North Korean dictators using the nuclear weapons to the threaten the security of the international world. So I believe that all these things lead to the new Cold War. And but from my experience, and I absolutely agree with Mr. Twining mentioned that we should be confident that those author, um, authoritarian states cannot thrive over the freedom and democracy. So yeah, I will say that's my final message that I want to deliver. Thank you. That's an excellent place to end. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all for a wonderful discussion. <laughs>